was a beautiful fall day, and I was doing exactly what I love to do. I was riding my bike. My friend Matt and I left Cherry Creek to ride out to Golden because I wanted to take him to Lookout Mountain. He was from Pennsylvania, and I thought I'd make him suffer at altitude. <laughs> so when we got to Lookout Mountain, we started climbing up the snake-curved road. And as we're going, I'm looking down, and everything below me, the building, the trees, the cars, were becoming miniature. And the higher I got, the more I felt like I was on top of the world. When we got to the very top of Lookout Mountain, I started feeling invincible. We turned around and we came down the hill and the wind was blowing through our helmets and we had smiles plastered on our face. When we got to the bottom, we turned onto 32nd Avenue and came east to come back to Denver. Well, I let Matt get in front of me and I was behind and I was lost in my thoughts and my daydreams of how I was on my way to becoming an elite level cyclist. When I looked up and I saw Matt crossing a street called Crabapple, I didn't think much of Crabapple Street until I saw that there was a car coming westbound, getting into its left-hand lane, and also turning onto Crabapple Street. I saw Matt make a big swerving motion around the car, and I thought, surely that driver sees that they almost hit a cyclist. But in that moment, I realized the driver didn't see anything. I went for my brakes. There was nothing abnormal for nine months. I was born on August 4th in Birmingham, Alabama. The doctor's first response was, why, ain't she? As he handed me to my parents, he said, she's gonna be special. I was born with a head full of white peach fuzz and pale skin. My parents realized that there was something different about their second child, their precious little girl. But fortunately, differences didn't stop my parents. We realized that my pale skin would bring a new light to my life, and the sunlight would forever be a struggle. But as a child, I would not live in the shadows. First you learn to crawl, then you learn to walk. I didn't do either, not for a long time at least. My mother's pregnancy with me was filled with bed rest and hospital stays, and she was on bed rest. She didn't get to eat anything but ice chips, just in case. For a solid six weeks, she was in the hospital until on May 8th, I was brought into this world six weeks early, a whole four pounds and three ounces via emergency C-section. They rushed me to the neonatal intensive care unit where I spent the next six weeks of my life. She got to go home, but she had to leave me there. It was the hardest thing for her. She knew that it was gonna be a difficult road even though they didn't find anything wrong with me. The weeks and the months that ensued were filled with frustration and tears, both by my parents and me. I was an inconsolable baby with a movement problem. I just didn't seem to move right. Nobody expects the headlines to be about them. My face was projected all over the local news and everybody knew what had happened. That was everybody but me. That night, it was supposed to be magical and memorable, just like you envision your high school dances to be. I had made all the plans and created all of the possible scenarios. Laser tag, dinner, the typical spend about five minutes at the dance thing, and then head off west on C-470 for a little midnight bowling. In my typical 16-year-old sneaky self, I had planned that evening to include my dreamy boyfriend, his two best friends, and two of my best girlfriends from the swim team. The group was perfect, our plan was perfect, our ride was perfect, and by some stroke of luck, we were even able to borrow my friend's dad's SUV for the night to secure that each one of us had enough room, a seatbelt, and the best mixtape in town. And so it was. The night began without a hitch. We finished our dinner, made our way to the dance to say some quick highs and bys, and then headed off towards the bowling alley. I don't remember very much from that night. But as the six of us stepped into that Suburban, I vaguely remember tugging down at my dress as I stepped into the back of the cab. And that would be the last time that I ever walked. I went for my brakes, but nothing happened. And the front wheel of my bike hit the front bumper of the car, 
I was launched in midair, landing on my back on the windshield and falling to the ground. And when I fell to the ground, my body felt disconnected. I could feel the warm pavement under my shoulders, but my legs felt like they were floating. I tried to get my knees to bend, my quads to tighten, my ankles to roll, but nothing happened. The date was September 17, 2000, and right there at the crossroads of 32nd and Crabtree, Crabapple, my whole life changed. So of course all this commotion was going above me and people were coming out of their homes and my friend was getting on his cell phone calling 911. The ambulance came, the fire truck, the policemen. And when the EMTs knelt down above me, they pulled out a neck brace, they slid it up my neck, fastened it around, moved me over to a backboard, onto a gurney, and into an ambulance. They took me to St. Anthony Central Hospital, and when I got there, all these nurses and doctors were above me barking all these medical terms and conditions, many of which I didn't understand. And a nurse took me, and she pushed me off into my own curtained-off cubicle, and she pulled out a large pair of metal shears. She slid them up my like recycling shorts to cut them off, and I knew that I should feel the cold metal against my skin, but I didn't feel anything. And after a whole battery of tests, CAT scans, x-rays, MRIs, at the end of the night, the doctors were able to tell my family that I had suffered a chest-level spinal cord injury and that I would never walk again. My pale skin would prove to be the least of my challenges. The effects of my albinism would be felt much later. I received my first pair of glasses when I was 10 months old. My first trip to the ocean, when I was one, would prove to be a difficult experience. I didn't have my glasses on when my parents held each hand as I waddled into the water. As the first wave approached, a sharp, loud scream came roaring out of my lungs. The shock from my parents sent, sent a deep concern that something was wrong. I was truly afraid of what I could not see. How was I to understand that a wave was going to go past me? I couldn't see depth. The wave was this mass of blue and white and a really loud noise. We learned that my greatest challenge was not going to be my skin. It was going to be how I would see. We were concerned about my vision. My parents taught me to jump the wave and take a ride. My parents taught me to see past the surface and to make a noise and a wave of my own. Finally, at two years old, I began walking, but I didn't walk normally. I started walking on my toes. My mom knew that something wasn't right, and after pestering the doctors some more, they finally agreed to do an MRI, and I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. My mom did not know what that would mean for me. All she knew was that I was not like my sisters. I ran into things, I walked on my toes, and I fell a lot. The doctors had said there would be lots of surgeries and physical therapy to come. All she knew was that I was the disabled child, that I would have to live with my disability forever. There was no cure. And it seemed as though my gait and my movements were going to make my life difficult, and everyone would see that I was different. 150 feet I flew, beyond the car, beyond my friends, beyond any memory of it, and beyond everything I've ever known. The only way that the paramedics were able to locate me was by following the spots of blood on the highway from where I had bounced. Once by my side, it was clear that there was nothing to do to save me. My neck was twisted, I wasn't breathing, I was bleeding out, and so they left me for dead. But at some point, I declared that I wasn't done yet and I moaned, sending the paramedics back to my side to give me one last chance. Sadly, Nobody was free from this tragedy. We had hit a van head on. The driver of that van was killed instantly, as was my boyfriend. In less than the time that it takes to sneeze, our entire lives have changed forever. My injuries were staggering. Broken femur, compound fracture of the tibia, two broken uh, wrists, dislocated hips, road rash that left me looking more like a burn patient than anything, collapsed lungs, but no, most notably, my broken back, which left me with less than no hope in sight. After my accident, 
people called me disabled. They looked at me with sorrow and pity in their eyes. They thought I was less. Different. They didn't see me. But I was still the same person. I hadn't changed. I had hopes and dreams. To be competitive. I wanted to make a difference. I saw a story and became a speaker and an author. I envisioned a picture and became an artist. I may move differently, but I became an athlete. I'm a teacher and a coach because I have a lesson to give. So Carrie, how do you write your story? <laughs> In braille. <laughs> Hannah, how do you see yourself? Falling down. Ryan, how do you move? This is how I roll. <laughs> Trish, how do you teach your lessons? I kick butt and take names. But embracing differences is what brings us all together, even when you can't find your way. Or you're feeling weak. Or your goals seem out of reach. Or you can't take the next step. So it's about overcoming perceived boundaries, inherent fears, and finding your strengths. I found my strength by learning to see things in a different way. The way I figured it, I had two choices. I could let my wheelchair confine me and define me, or I could look at it differently, maybe as a sport. It's not the kind of sport you choose for yourself. It's not swimming or gymnastics or soccer. And wheelchair jumping is not going to be in the X Games. <laughs> but I was a cyclist, and I was used to having two wheels under me. And I realized that being in a wheelchair takes the same physical awareness and the same mental fortitude that I had been training for my whole life as an athlete. And when I started looking at things differently, I realized that my life wasn't going to be over. I could still do the same things I'd always done. I just have to find a new way to do them. And when I started changing that, changing my view and the way I looked, I realized there was so much open to me and that I could do anything I wanted to do. I learned growing up to listen and feel with a great sense of conviction. It was in middle school where all children are searching to find their place that I too learned so much about myself. I was always creative and willing to explore, but now I was looking at a different canvas with a new light full of color and shape that could create my own picture. I truly learned that I was becoming an artist with a new vision. I truly learned that art is not eyesight, art is insight. I found my inner strength through sports. At six years old, with the encouragement of my physical therapist, I began skiing. I didn't know where that would lead me. All I knew then was that I was not the six-year-old little girl who couldn't participate in gym. I was free from the restrictions of my body. I could ski as good, if not better, than the other kids my age. And truth is, I can ski far better than I can walk. So when I'm free on the ski slopes, I gain strength, confidence, and self-esteem. And that carried over into so many other aspects of my life, and I have been able to help others and make a difference. Elite athlete is not a title that you earn. It's something that you create. And it's that reality and that attitude that has helped me overcome my challenges and physical weaknesses. I've been able to represent my country through sports and be a successful athlete and ski racer several different times because I never allowed myself to give up. I found strength in myself when there was no other option. My accident, disability, and differences, they forced me to look at the world with more of a raw eye. It was now my job to show the world what I was made of and what I could still accomplish. My senses were keen, and I made conscious decisions to wake up each morning with a smile. The perspective that was given to me from all of the experiences in my life are something that I would never take back. And on some level, that accident was the best thing that has ever happened to me. It forced me to see me. My strength lies in all of the lessons that I've learned. And those lessons that have been offered up from the universe, I started sharing them with my students, my swimmers, my family and friends. How could I keep such insight and wisdom to myself? Being able to weave in stories of hope 
and encouragement in the midst of a lesson on mitosis, of all things. That makes me feel whole. Being able to have a conversation with a young swimmer about his crooked technique, but his capabilities of really making it, if he could really just push a little bit further, that makes my heart sing. And being that adult to connect with a teen when she thinks that no one will understand, that lets me know that I'm doing the right thing. And that night, when I lost the ability to walk, left something rather special in its place. It left the hope and the drive for a better tomorrow that I have vowed to share with all who will listen until the day that I have no more voice nor strength. As it turns out, the four of us aren't so different than all of you. Everyone in this room has a unique view of the world. And the thing is, is that our differences, even though we all have disabilities and we're all diverse and di distinct, our differences allow us to find your vision, move through life, teach your lessons, and tell your story. Thank you.